This is a crash course on how to properly size your wiring as well as proper fusing. In this video, you're going to get the best visual representation of cable sizing and fuses you've ever seen. And yes, it has something to do with water and fire hoses. I'm going to give you an actual visual demonstration and using water to visualize electricity has been the most helpful thing for me in my journey about learning this. So take note, I've got two quote unquote water wires, AKA hoses. I've got a two gauge hose and I've got a four aught gauge hose down here. I'm going to apply 70 volts of water pressure to both of these and I'm gonna let you see what happens. Okay, we've got uh, the power turned on. Both have the same pressure applied to them, but uh, check out the difference between the delivered capacity. This uh, two gauge hose is shooting very far. Look at the tiny amount of electricity getting delivered from it versus what the four aught gauge delivery rate is. So I get way more delivered capacity out of the fire hose compared to the garden hose. Again, it's the same pressure, 70 PSI on both, but because I have space for a higher volume of water to travel through that fire hose, I'm getting way, way more delivered capacity. And so I can accomplish more work, so to speak, put down more water faster with the fire hose compared to a standard garden hose. And the exact same thing applies to electricity. So when we go in to talk about the electrical connections inside of things, I'm going to be using the term of voltage and amps. Voltage very simply is the pressure, the PSI on the side of electricity. I had 70 PSI on this water. When we go in and look at uh, the electric wiring, I'm gonna have say 51.2 volts, 51.2 PSI of electricity pushing from the batteries and other voltages as well. But uh, voltage is pressure, amperage is volume. So we just saw that in action here. This fire hose delivers way more volume than the garden hose does, even though they're both getting the same quote unquote voltage applied to them. Now there's another aspect uh, here that uh, is helpful to visualize. Notice that uh, feeding off my water system, I have multiple valves. So I can customize in four different places right here where water goes. Maybe I don't want water to go somewhere. So I can simply shut one of these valves off and isolate that part from the system. Here's my hose bib that was feeding the garden hose we saw squirting. Notice that it has a valve on it. You'd be dumb to install a irrigation system with no valves. So when you turn the water on, water's just flying everywhere at all locations with no ability to isolate different areas in different parts. That would be stupid, right? Same thing with my fire hose attachment uh, right here. Down inside there, you can see I've got a valve that can isolate this fire hose port for me. Let's say I have a problem with the fire hose. I can isolate that, but still go ahead and run the garden hose without affecting anything else. Okay, but now let's pretend we have a catastrophic failure. And uh, my main water line that uh, is underground uh, right here that uh, feeds the whole system ruptures and shorts to ground. Literally, the, the water loses its path. It's going to go in the path of least resistance. And so if that pipe ruptures, the water is going to start leaking everywhere underground, right where that rupture is. And reduced capacity or no capacity is going to continue flowing through the pipe at all. Well, that's why I have a safety built in right here. This is the main water shutoff. So I can pull this lever down and it will completely shut all the water down going into my irrigation system. System, thus preventing the water to continue to come out of that uh, ruptured short underground, causing damage, flooding, sinkhole, etc, etc. So keeping the visual of the water in mind, let's look a little closer now at my tower of power here and uh, what I've got going on here. So first we have the power sources and they're trying to get to the end of the hose, so to speak, to flow into my house and, you know, power different loads and stuff. So the trick is to safely conduct that power from the source to where it needs to go, just like my plumbing system outside. Have ways of customizing and isolating things so that we don't have all the spigots on at once. 
and protect against catastrophic failure. If for some reason, let's say inside the inverter, we have a rupture along the path of the electricity and it shorts to ground, how are we gonna stop the flow of power to that to prevent damage and instead of flooding like water, you know, fire and melting of components, etc. Guys, let me just insert the good old legal stuff here. I am not a licensed electrician or solar installer or anything like that. I'm just some random dude on YouTube. Do not take what I'm about to show you as the gospel. Working with this kind of stuff can result in severe bodily injury or even death as well as property damage. And attempting to do this uh, yourself is very dangerous and should not be attempted. This video is strictly for entertainment purposes only. So the calculations are very, very simple. And I'm gonna go through this in as basic and clear way as I can possibly make it. Let's use this top row of batteries. These each are a 12 volt lithium iron phosphate battery. We can have a whole other video and discussion about connecting batteries in series versus parallel. But in my case here, I have four of these batteries connected into series, create a 48 volt battery pack. Once again, the voltage is the pressure. Each of these batteries is rated to discharge up to 100 amps of power. Once again, that is volume of power. Because I have 48 volts of pressure with 100 amps of volume, I need to size my hose, my wires, to be able to accommodate that amount of volume that I need delivered. So it's very easy because the maximum power that I could possibly draw from this bank to be safe is 100 amps. You can simply look up online a chart that gives you an amp rating for the specific gauge wire and the distance that needs to run. Now, the shorter the distance, the better. In my case, I'm using two gauge wire. Typically, each battery is going to have a BMS, a battery, a battery management system, that will automatically shut the flow of power off at the battery if it exceeds say 100 amps like these batteries are rated for. As you can see, I have tested a gazillion of these batteries over the years, and I have found that some are really good at that and others are not. I don't want to run the risk of not having the BMS protect the battery in an overcurrent event. So again, I've overkilled things. You, do, you don't necessarily need to do this, but again, I sleep better at night doing this. Every single battery has a fuse on it. This, these little white things are fuses. This is one of those fuses right here. It's gonna be difficult for you to see, but you see how it says 125? So it's rated for 125 amps, and you it's really hard to see because it's pretty faint, but at the bottom it says 80 volts. So listen carefully, this is the calculation and the understanding you need. You need to find the maximum continuous amp draw that your batteries would ever be under. In my case, it's 100 amps. You need to size the wire appropriately, and you can do that with the simple wiring chart. And then the calculation for the fusing is 25% to 50% greater than the max potential current that will be drawn from your batteries. So I like to err on the side of caution if you haven't discovered already. So I went 25% over the rated amp draw from these batteries. So 125 amp. So that way, if I exceed for some reason, drawing more than 125 amps from any of these batteries, or one of the batteries has an internal short and power starts flowing into it or whatever, the hope is that the fuse will blow and stop the current. The fuses are like valves in my plumbing system, right? They will shut the flow of water off, or the flow of power in this case, in the event of a catastrophic failure of some kind, or an overcurrent event, whatever that may be. Okay, now talking about fuses, voltage is an important consideration. Notice that these uh, fuses are rated up to 80 volts. I have a 48 volt battery pack. Right when they finish charging, they're usually knocking on the door of 58 volts at times. So I need a fuse that is strong enough to withstand up to that 58 volt pressure. If I don't, if I use a fuse that's only rated 32 volts, for example, this battery pack has enough pressure that it can actually overcome the fuse, even if the fuse tries to blow and the power will continue to flow through it and there will be no way to use that fuse to stop the flow any longer. So very, very very important to be sure and get the appropriate voltage rated fuse for the kind of voltage you're dealing with. Now remember what I said back when I was showing the water about having valves and spigots to customize the flow of water? Well, notice that uh, on each of these strings, so these four batteries feed into this right here, 
Uh, this actually comes from a golf cart battery down here. This one connects to this string of four batteries, etc., etc. Back in here on the EG4 wall mount battery, notice that it has a little breaker built into it as well. Well, these little breakers, I call them disconnects in my case, are like those spigots. It allows me to disconnect, isolate every single part of my battery so I can break it up into small segments if I need to or have an issue with one part I can keep it out of the mix and let everything else continue to function. Very very important to have. Now I know a lot of people will try to use breakers as an overcurrent protection device which a fuse is as well. They can work for that and I think it's wise to have some in it. These are breakers and they are rated up to the voltage of this battery bank. However, breakers are funny because their rating, their interrupt rating can vary widely. And I've even seen some that are good and rated, but they don't trip. So I have multiple layers. I have this in here and it's rated to 100 amps. My hope is that if there's a, a slight overcurrent in this uh, string of batteries, that before I blow a slightly more expensive fuse, I hope this pops. Because when it pops, it's as easy as just pushing this button and resetting it, and I don't have to replace a blown fuse. But I do not rely on this as an overcurrent protection device. I simply use this as a means of disconnect for each part of my tower of power here. So each of these strings of batteries connect with their two gauge cable. All those two gauge cables come and run into a manifold. And picture a plumbing ma manifold uh, like you see here on your screen. This in technical terms is a bus bar right? Uh, the negative bus bar right over here and a positive bus bar over here. Once again, you need to be sure and be sensitive to the rating of the bus bar. These are from Overkill Solar. I'll leave a link for them down in the description. They can support up to a thousand amps of power, which I should never, ever, ever see flowing through this. This is my main positive wire coming off the positive bus bar, and I have another equal size cable coming off the negative bus bar. Well, if you take a look here, notice that this is going through a T-class fuse. They can extinguish DC arcs exceptionally well. And after I combine all of my batteries together, on these bus bars here, I step up the size of the wire because now I'm getting closer to that fire hose size, right? I'm bringing in all of these garden hoses and they're combining together in this uh, bus bar right here. And then they're flowing out through a larger size hose, so to speak, that can carry more current. But then I have a master valve, so to speak, on that that has the capability of disconnecting substantially more power, like fire hose volume of power compared to, you know, one of these types of fuses. Now, technically, if we were to add up all of the current that this battery bank could produce, this wire is a little small. I believe this is a two watt gauge wire. Well, I'm not super worried about that because I've actually downsized the size of this fuse. This is actually only a 200 amp fuse. And the reason I did that is unique to me. Uh, it's not going to be the case for everyone, but I'll tell you why I did that. That's because this power comes in here and actually feeds onto the bus bar of this wall mount battery right here. This bus bar is rated to only 600 amps of power. So this wall mount battery can supply 200 amps of power to that bus bar. So now I only have 400 amps to work with. So bringing all the power from the tower of power here brings in another 200 amps because that's what I've limited it to with that fuse. And then I've got another wall mount battery that uh, you can see here in this box that uh, I have yet to build, but that is going to be feeding in and connecting to these last two ports right here, which is going to max out my 600 amps rated capacity on the bus bars inside this battery. And so that's why I've derated the size of that fuse. Going back to a quick comment on why I fused every single individual battery. Uh, they're all different brands and made at different times. So I wanted to be extra cautious uh, hooking these up together. Uh, but then I also wanted to try to help protect against internal shorts in the batteries themselves. Very rare, but sometimes can happen. And I didn't want a whole, you know, tower of powers worth of power feeding back into a shorted battery and not having any kind of protection along the way. So that's why every single battery is fused. Now, like I said, uh, I've got to make a, a whole video about um, parallel versus series connecting of batteries. But you have to remember that the voltage, the pressure 
plays in a vital role in sizing your wires. If I did not have these connected in series, but rather parallel, parallel connecting is going to increase the amps that my batteries can produce, but keep the voltage the same. So if I connected all four of these 12 volt batteries in parallel, I'd have a 12 volt system capable of producing 400 amps of power continuously. And so I would have to significantly increase I'd have to double, literally, the size of this cable in order to carry that kind of power. But there's a better way to do parallel batteries that uh, I'll show you that involves some bus bars and different things that uh, I think make it a whole lot safer. So stay tuned for that. Speaking of fire hoses, do you feel like you're drinking out of one right now? <laughs> the thing to remember, and this is probably the easiest way that I've remembered, is plus 50%. So you take your max potential current, add a 50%, and that's the size of conductor you need to put on your batteries to be safe. Take the max amount of current that your batteries can produce, add 50% to that, and that is the size of fuse you need to add or you can be conservative like me and just do 25%. But the purpose of the fuse, remember, is not to protect the batteries. The BMS is going to take care of that for the most part. The purpose of the fuse is mostly actually to protect your conductors, because if all of a sudden something shorted to ground over here and you have a free path for all this power to just go rushing over into there and there's no way to stop it, lithium batteries can discharge thousands and thousands of amps and you add multiples of them together and you've got insane amounts of power. That amount of power flowing through smaller cables that aren't rated for thousands and thousands of amps will literally liquefy them. It will melt it into molten metal and fall apart. Molten metal falling onto combustible things obviously asking for a fire. And so that's the purpose of overcurrent protection. Number one, and first and foremost, to protect the conductors from melting and keep them intact. That thing is guaranteed to be 100% safe, but doing your due diligence can go a long ways in making things safe. Okay guys, comment down below if this visual water representation helped you understand electricity and cable sizing and fuses. It helped me so much when I saw something like this just explained to me by a friend of mine and uh, that's really where things clicked. So anyway, I hope this was helpful to you. Don't forget to do the five free things. Like, comment, share, subscribe, and hype. I've also got links down in the description to places where you can ask me direct questions as well as even schedule a consulting call if you need uh, personal assistance. But I've always got more great videos coming up and I'm gonna try my best to continue bringing this uh, valuable educational content to you. Comment down below on what you think of my fire hose. Isn't that epic? Not very many people in the suburbs of a city can have access to a full-on fire hose. And uh, let me know down below if you're interested in seeing more details on how I have this and how it all works. All right, everyone stay safe out there and we'll catch y'all next time.